to speak. Uh, David George Brooks, so they call him the gratitude guy, has been a speaker, a teacher, life coach, and the best-selling author for over 25 years. Uh, he is a former Nordstrom sales manager and has managed in the corporate world for over 30 years. He is the author of the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, and Happiness Starts with Gratitude, and Gratitude Nuggets to Chew On. He was recently featured on New Day with Margaret Larson on Team TV and Chat with Women on KC Radio. With over 400 gratitude videos posted on YouTube, thousands have seen his message, and he is now considered a leading authority on gratitude and how living a life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life. So uh, let's give him a warm a round of applause for today. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Scott, for inviting me. In fact, Bill Taylor, I was looking at Bill and I have, I, I have such a good memory typically and I thought, that's Bill Taylor. <laughs> Let me ask by a show of hands, how many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? Thank you, about 90% of the room. I am fortunate enough to speak to all the way from 18 year old kids, I'm doing a couple of commencement speeches this June and up to uh, 90, 95 year old people at rest homes. And regardless of that age range, it's anywhere from half to 80, 90% of the people that raise their hand when I say that. Now I'll tell you very briefly about my significant personal loss in my life. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday, I woke up and I looked over in bed and my wife Dana wasn't there. I thought that's awfully strange. And just then Connor, my four year old comes in, where's mom? I, I don't know. So we get out of bed and we go down the hallway and here comes Kyle, my 14 year old, same question. I don't know, we can't find her. So we look in a couple of rooms and we walk down. We look downstairs and in front of the washer and dryer, here's Dana all crumpled over. So we go running down there, turn her over, stuff's coming out of her mouth. It didn't look very good. Connor starts crying, what's wrong with mommy? And I said to Kyle, go call the police and fire. And within a matter of a few minutes, 20, 25 people are in our home. And I've never seen anything like it. It was the most surrealistic thing I'd ever seen. Wires and tubes and those paddles, just like you see on TV. And they had her out on the floor and everything and they were working on her. And when I talk to people that raise their hand about having suffered from something, and I'm always glad when I sell my books and journals and things, but regardless of that, whoever comes and talks to me afterwards and talks to me about their personal experience, one of the things that people share is that when something like this happens, you lose all measure of time. And I wasn't sure how much time had gone by and this little short fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brook, we've been working on your wife for 45 minutes to an hour. We still have no heartbeat. Do you want us to keep going? And I remember thinking, even in a state of shock, there's still some part of your brain that's still working. And I thought about it for a few minutes and I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. And she was 38 years old. And what made this so amazing to me is not only the passage of time, but within about two or three days, people had come to my home and family and friends. Everybody's trying to help out and they're bringing food and, and it just we're teaming with people, trying to help through a tough time like this. But I remember a couple days later walking up to this little deck. We lived down by Green Lake. And I remember sort of pinching my skin and just going, you know, I'm just another little guy here trying to get through life, just skin and bones, and I'm nothing special. But I, I clearly saw for the first time in my life why people killed themselves. I remember thinking about it for a few minutes. I just kind of looked up at the sky. I thought about it for three or four minutes. I thought, you know, I'm not going to do that. My boys have already lost their mother. I'm not going to go jump off some bridge. It sure felt like it, but I'm not going to do it. But what made it so challenging for me, Jason was asking me, did you grow up in Seattle? And I graduated from Queen Anne High School and went to the University of Washington. I had lost so many people. My father was a pretty doggone good attorney and he killed himself one day. This is when I was fairly young. And then my mom had died of cancer. A couple of my buddies, the night I mentioned I graduated to Queen Anne High School on Dexter crashed and died. It just went on and on and on. And I remember thinking, how are you gonna survive this, Dave? And I was kidding Jason and uh, mentioned I think to Scott too about this whole thing with PowerPoint. My favorite part of talking to groups is get to look at people's eyes. I don't need a PowerPoint and I need to flip slides and all this kind of thing. And you get to see people and I get to see these looks in the eyes that have gone through similar roads and my question's always the same. How did you survive? 
What was your coping mechanism? And one of the things I decided right at the outset is it all depends on how you look at something. So I'd like to ask you all just to stand for a second if you'd be so kind. Just take a second. And I want you just to take your right hand and just start turning, raise it up and turn it in a clockwise manner. Now I know we're in a digital world, so <laughs> here's a watch if anybody's uncertain. That is clockwise. Just keep it going clockwise. Kind of stretch out for that nice dinner. Now just start bringing it down real slowly, keeping it going clockwise. Down to your forehead, your eyes, chin, chest, and waist. Now what direction is it going? Who said counterclockwise? Yes. Taylor. Taylor did. <laughs> okay, you can sit down. <laughs> now you see, I want you to look at Eric. Because Eric is doing, which is my favorite thing people do. They keep, they go, what the? And, and, they, and I've had friends of mine, fraternity brothers, come up to me and go, you know, I saw you speak the other day. It wasn't any big deal. But what's the story with that circle thing? The people like change. I go, no, you idiot. You graduated from high school, from college. <laughs> You look at it above or below. I could say your glass is half full or half empty. It's just a way of saying you have a choice. We were talking about that earlier with a choice. So I realized at that point I had a choice. And I thought, I'm gonna, I made up my mind. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to raise these two boys of mine. I'm not going to let this thing defeat me. But I'm going to have to figure out something along the way that's going to help me. But I realized, first of all, it takes as long as it takes. Every, I keep talking about looking at these eyes. I can see Doug, and I can see John, and I can see James, Scott. Let me see who else. Remember? DV, Angela, Eric, Joanne, Bob. I'll tell you why I remember names in a little bit. But I can see people, and they figure out, what is your coping mechanism? And it takes as long as it takes. I am 64 years old. A couple of people are looking. God, he didn't look a day over 63. <laughs> I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19. It took me 42 years to realize my dream. I'd worked at Nordstrom, as you heard Scott or Jason say in the bio. I was actually a store manager for Nordstrom for several stores. That wasn't my ultimate dream. But I realized it was going to take as long as it took. I don't care how long it was. So here's Connor, who's four years old, and I'm now being told by the nursery school thing or the preschool thing, he's got problems. We need to have him tested. I said, his mom just died for crying out. Yeah, well, he's messed up. So they put him through all these tests. They were bouncing balls and doing all these different things with him. And I remember it was about an eight-hour day. And then later they said, have him go sit in the lobby, and we want to talk to you, the dad. So they said, your son is really messed up. I said, I know, I heard that earlier. He's going to need all sorts of, they had all these things, occupational therapy and and I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, let me tell you something. I was a pretty decent athlete. And even though he was four and a half, this was about six months after Dana died, I said, he's going to be the quarterback at Roosevelt High School someday. And she starts laughing. Never forget it. She goes, <laughs> no, he's not. In fact, he's going to have a tough time in life. So I went out to the car. I got in the car. And I'm a pretty emotional person. I, start, I started crying. I couldn't stop crying. I just drove all the way home. And Connor kept going, Daddy, what's wrong? I said, nothing, Connor. It's okay. Daddy's just having a tough day. But Connor was going to keep trying. And I, knew, I noticed something about both he and Kyle after Dana had passed away. They were going to keep trying. And I said, you know, you can't give up. Winston Churchill never, ever, ever, ever give up. So Connor's big thing is he, want, he may not be want to go into football, but he wanted to play baseball. Now, for those of you that are parents, there's coach pitch and there's t-ball. Okay, now t-ball... The ball doesn't even move. It just sits on the tee. I'm not quite sure how hard it is to hit a ball that just sits on a tee. Connor couldn't hit it. So he'd be swinging up here, and I'd go, Connor, get the concept here, bud. The ball is right here. Dad, I'm doing the best I can. So he adjusts his swing. He finally goes down. He hits the tee. The ball goes forward. He goes, I got to hit. <laughs> and I, 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 was, I was, liked his positive attitude, but that's not how the game was played. But, but he kept trying. He just kept trying, and he couldn't hit. He couldn't run, he couldn't catch, he couldn't throw, and he couldn't hit. Outside of that, he was okay. <laughs> but I remember August 31st, 2005, he was about 10 or 11 at the time. We're playing the game, and it's actually at Everest Park. And it's 7 to 6. They're down, it's the bottom of the 7th. And I think they're out of guys. Because there's nobody else left, and he didn't play. So I look over to the dugout, and it's the bottom of the seventh. Two guys are out. 
There's a guy in second, a guy in third. Guess who comes out of the dugout? I look over, oh Lord. Here comes Connor. He's walking all confident, swinging the bat like he's, you know, Willie Mays or somebody. And then he goes, Dad, I'm up! <laughs> he looks up in the stands, like, oh, kids don't talk to their parents in the stands. This is tough. So he gets up and ball one, ball two, ball three, ball, or strike two rather, full count. Next pitch comes in. He just rips it down the third base line. Goes inside the bag, goes into left field. The guy from third comes in. The guy from second rounds hits third. Goes to home. The ball comes in. The catcher catches it. They all crash together and the ball pops out. And they win the game 8-7. to seven. Connor's standing out in second base. Dad, I got a hit! <laughs> the entire team comes out of the dugout goes out to second base puts them on their shoulders and carries them off the field I couldn't talk about an hour and a half I had such a big lump in my throat even though this has been a number of years now nine or ten it still gets me choked up because I remember when we came home that night and we sat down on the bed and I said Connor it was never ever ever about baseball it's the fact you never gave up. And he didn't. And I think he got that from me and he got it from his older brother. That even though Dana had died and all these other people had passed on, he's not going to go that route. And he graduated from Bothell High School last year and he was the leadoff hitter on the baseball team. Best hitter on the team. And I remember thinking, if you're not going to give up, you've got to have these examples. There's all these people. I mentioned I'm 64. Colonel Sanders started KFC at 64. All these guys, Rocky, Sylvester Stallone, Disney, they never gave up when they went to banks to get their finances. They didn't take no for an answer. But as I said, the same thing with a circle exercise. A lot of it depends on how you look at things. So when you go out and get in those cars tonight, notice that this windshield is about this deep and it's about this wide. It's a pretty good size. And then notice the rear view mirror. It's about like that. And keep that in mind when you're going through your life. I don't care what the average age is. I'm, I'm easily in the, in the, right in the target range at 64 of the group here. It doesn't matter. I don't care how old you are. It makes no difference. Look mostly in the front. Pay attention a little bit in the back. If you see some flashing blue lights, you may want to pull over. <laughs> but for the most part, pay attention to what's in front of you and learn it. Along the way, I realized that you got to get rid of this junk. And the same thing with the windshield and the rearview mirror. People do it all the time. They drive over junk. They pick it up from behind them, put it in front, and drive over it again. Again and again. And I am blessed enough to do workshops. I'm not going to do any tonight with exercise. I have a lot of exercises that talk to you about how you get this crap out of here and make room for gratitude, which is what changed my whole life. One of the biggest things that people keep driving over is ex-spouses. We all just had it with old Fred. He messed up my life. Hey, when did you get divorced? Uh, 63. <laughs> Do you really think that's 50 years ago? You think it's time to get over that? Yeah, well, that guy's just, uh, blah, blah. you know, get over it and kind of move on. So I have this buddy of mine, and he says, just like the lady told me about Connor, Dave, you're kind of messed up. My fraternity brothers, I know very well, graduated 40, 50 years ago. This buddy of mine says, you need to get a gratitude journal. Now, how many have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Angela, a couple others, Bill. Well, I'd never heard of one. I'd heard of a journal, I heard of a diary and things, but so I got one. I ordered one from Amazon. This is my own I made, but not this one. And I started writing in it, and I started noticing a lot of good things happening because we live in this world where everybody seems to focus on the negative, what we don't have versus what we have. And what this journal does is it gives you an example. Everything takes five minutes. I've timed this a thousand times. Five minutes to write in this gratitude journal about what you're grateful for. And I feel it really started to change me. And I have a little saying in the front of it that says, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. And people always say, especially the kids in schools, sometimes they get questions out of the assembly. Do you have an app? Is there an app for our phone? Yeah. And I go, well, actually, there is. I actually have an app. And you can, it says the Brookers Daily Gratitude Journal, and you press a button. I'm so grateful to Scott Rethke and Jason Overlease for inviting me today. Types it. Oh, wow, there it is right there. 
It's not the same. It's not this reason why we something visceral about how it gets in connected. It starts with a thought up here in our CPU, our brain. Maybe it goes to our heart, our arm, our hand, the pen, the paper, and you write it down. I'm glad I got a chance to meet DV. There's something about it that you write it down. Five minutes is all it really takes. So here's what I'd like to do. I want to do just, you don't have to stand up or anything, but I just want to do a little exercise. One of the things I do in here says day and date. This is my journal. In fact, you're not going to be able to see it, but there's a picture of my little four-year-old son, the leadoff hitter, who's now down in college in San Diego, who was told he wasn't going to be good enough and wasn't smart enough and is doing quite well. I'm extremely proud of both my sons that did not give up. And again, when I get to hear those stories, I hear stories that make my stories look like nothing. And I'm just so proud of people that are looking for a healthy coping mechanism in this world of all these deadly ones. I didn't mention that Dana died of a prescription pill overdose. 38, tall, blonde, absolutely gorgeous. Our first date was running Green Lake. She could, I'm a fast runner. She could beat me. And she got hooked on Vicodin and Oxycontin and all this stuff and overdosed one day back there. So right here it says, day and date, it says daily number. So here's what your daily number is. I want you all to think about this for a second. One to ten. Ten is the best day of your life, and one is maybe one of the toughest days of your life. I just all want you to think about what your number is right now. No halves, just pick a number, okay? So get that number in your head, and if you're between a one and a five, I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I just want to get a pulse. How many people here are six? Okay, one, two, maybe sevens. Okay, a few more. Eights. Okay, bigger number. Nines. Two, three. And any tens? Joanne and Bill. Joanne, right? Yeah. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Thank you. I want you to think about a couple of things. And I usually have you write this down because it's very effective, as I just said, but we don't have time for that. I've only got limited time tonight. But I want you to think about what's the number one thing you're most grateful for in your life? And I'm not going to give you any hints. I know what it is for me. I write it every single day along with a lot of other things. But what's the number one thing you're most grateful for? So think about that and plant that in your brain. Okay? Now, I want you to think about the second thing you're most grateful for. Got to pick one. Now you get to pick two. And these are very personal. You don't have to look at anybody or compare notes. or It's just you. Whatever it is in your life. So there's those two things. And I'm going to ask you to add one more thing. Today... Or yesterday, what was the highlight of your day? What was the best thing that happened? I will, tell you I will tell you this. Typically, the highlight of my day is one of these talks. I get to do two or three of these a week. Every time I, no matter what frame of mind I'm in, I get in that car and I look in that windshield, and I'm always, if I'm on eight, I'm always a nine or a nine and a half or a ten. Because I get to meet people and I get to impact some lives. So think about that. The thing you're most grateful for, the second thing you're most grateful for, and what was the highlight of your day? Now I want you to think in terms of that number again and see if there was any difference. So think about how that frames your mind, just thinking about those three things. And once again, I'm going to have you raise your hand. So one to five, don't raise your hand. Sixes. Okay, no sixes. Sevens. Couple. Eights. Quite a few. And nines. Okay. And tens. Thank you. It's been great to see you. I appreciate it. <laughs> so we had Joanne and Bill, and then we added about four or five more people. When I do that on paper, and these, and thank you so much for that. I appreciate that, because people go, how much you pay those guys? <laughs> I didn't pay them anything. But that is just a quick example of how we frame this with gratitude. And when I do these workshops, I talk about embracing gratitude and why it is such a healthy coping mechanism. Clear out your brain and make room for gratitude. Get rid of that junk, just like stuff in a garage. It takes as long as it takes. It's never too late. I, care. I don't care how old you are. And then get a gratitude journal. I am fortunate enough to do radio. And they always ask me, the last thing is, well, what can you tell listeners today? What is the, uh, what's the one message? So I go, just try it. Just try it. Try it for a week. Of the 20 or 25 people that died in my life, half of them were of their own hand. Suicide, pills, booze, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. I mean, if Dana had been hit by a bus or something, it would be different, but that was not the case. So I would like to do something real quick. I want to give away a book. 
So I'm going to ask Jason, if you guys have your business cards, I want to do a drawing for a book real quick. I don't know if everybody has cards, but I always like to give away a book and I want to tell you about, Jason. I want to tell you about this book. I've done a number of books why Jason is picking, is getting those cards. Oh, and by the way, I do send out a video on Monday. If you don't want, I send that out a two-minute video on Monday about gratitude. If you don't want it, don't put your card in there because I usually will send it, but you can always unsubscribe too. But here's what I wanted to tell you about this book. I did a couple of books that were collaborations where they had a bunch of authors. You'd send in your, your article, and mine, of course, was on, was on gratitude. And I did one that's actually back there. And I sent in 27 different articles about gratitude and got rejected every single time until the 28th one. And I remember seeing it because it always said the email was from Ready Aim, the publisher, and the first part of the email said, thank you. And you knew it was for your contribution, you know, but we don't want you. And then finally an email came one day and it said, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and they took it. Well, this happens to be the book I'm giving away today is 50 Gratitude Stories to Direct, Inspire, and Empower You. And um, thank you, sir. So thank you. Let me just grab one real quick here. We'll see who this is. And the winner is John Pruitt. Oh, man. <laughs> thank you, John. <laughs> well, thank you, and, and I want John. I want you. You segued perfectly. I want to tell you what happened to me recently. I was uh, at a group, and I always like to give away a book. Sometimes the kids they don't have them, so I'll do tickets or something. But it was a chamber, and so it's like 200 people, and so I draw the gal's name, and they, Sally, and clap, 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 and she comes up from the back, and I walk off the stage, I hand her the book, and I said, "Here you go, congratulations." And she goes, "Yeah, great." And I said, hey, if you'd like later, I'll sign that for you. She goes, that's okay. <laughs> so I, I make no, uh, I don't think I'm John Grisham or something. I'm just trying to, to, trying to make a difference here a little bit. The last thing I want to just mention, a couple more things and I'll wrap up, is that I mentioned that my, uh, this daily number, and thank you again, because there was, a couple of tens and then there was six or seven or eight tens. My mother had died of cancer but before that she was manic depressive and it used to just irritate the heck out of me. I'm, I'm the second of five but I was the closest. She always leaned on me and I was working at the University Bookstore going to the University of Washington and she'd get these depressive states and she would call me and she'd get me on the phone and she'd take these pills and she'd go like this. I have the sleeping pills right here David. If you don't come over and see me over in Magnolia, I'm going to take them all right now. Because you just shake them. And I just, Mr. Gallup, I need to leave. My mom isn't feeling good. I didn't know what to do. Well, she never killed herself, but she later died of cancer. But I think I got some of that depression stuff from her. And it used to really bug me. And I'll tell you, the last thing I'm going to do is take a pill. I know there's valuable pills out there, but after what it did to my wife and friends and things, so... There was one day I woke up and I was at two. And I was really depressed and I thought, you better get your rear end down to Starbucks. You better write in your gratitude journal. So I went down to Starbucks and I wrote in and it bumped me up to about a four or five. And um, I felt a little better. Grateful for my health and grateful for my two sons and grateful for the Jasons and Scotts that invite me to places and all these different things. But it still wasn't usually the seven, eight, nine where I usually am. But I was doing a talk that day at, Burlington Chamber of Commerce. So I drove up to Burlington and I did a talk and after about 250, it's a big chamber. These people are all lined up and they're buying the books and this gal comes up and she's crying. Can I give you a hug? I'm single, so you can imagine. <laughs> it was nice to get a hug. She goes, my name is Janice and you just changed my life. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I don't, thank you Janice, I don't know if I changed your life, maybe I gave you some tools. But she goes, well, whatever, I, I, thank you. And I, I said, what was it? She, I can't tell you a couple of your stories, a little longer presentation. And I walked out and I said, thank you. And I, she bought a journal or something. And I said, thank you and talked to some other people. And I walked out to the car. And if you ever wonder, every one of you sitting here, who your best friend is in life, who's the first person you call when you get really good or bad news? I think that's one way you know. It was really good or really bad. That was, so I wanted to call Connor. Tell him about what had just happened. And it was Connor first and Kyle second. 
But I elected not to, and I was running a Lowe's home improvement at the time. And I quit to do this full time. And I got back in my car, and I thought, I'm not going to call anybody. I'm just going to enjoy this moment. And I realized I was a nine now. I'd gone from a two <laughs> to a five to a nine by writing in my journal and by helping somebody that day. And I took the rearview mirror, I'm driving along I-5, and I just turn the mirror and I go, I'm so freaking proud of you. <laughs> it's not where the hammers and nails. Who cares? It lows. God. <laughs> Goofball company. Anyway. Um, sorry. But I really realized that I was making a difference. And that's what something like this can do. And I tell people that are struggling. A lot of people struggle. I heard something yesterday on um, Jim Cramer. It was one of those. He said, there's two types of people in this company or this country. The unemployed people and the people that hate their jobs. <laughs> well, if you hate your job, I'll tell you, life's going by fast. I've lost a lot of people, as I mentioned. You may want to think about changing. I'll tell you, something in embracing gratitude can make a big difference. So last thing I want to do is, as I mentioned, embracing gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. Don't ever give up. Make room for gratitude. Get rid of the crud in your brain. Get a gratitude journal. And the final thing is, what you'll notice anybody that's enthusiastic about something talks about is sharing it. So I want to do a little exercise. I call this the four T's. So how many people here by show of hands have used their smartphone since I've been talking? See, there's always a few honest people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's always, there's always, there's a, so I'd like you all to take out your smartphones. Assuming most of you have them. You want to know what I did? Uh, no. <laughs> nice, John. Really nice. Okay. Yes. Can I tell you what I did with it? Yes. I put down gratitude. Good job. Thank you, John. <laughs> so here's what I want you to do. That's. Here's what I want you to do. Take everybody. Take out your smartphones. I'm going to give you 60 seconds, and I want you to do one of the four T's: text, tweet, telephone or tell somebody in 60 seconds how grateful you are to have them in your life. I don't care which method you use. Most people do texting. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Start right now. Thanks, Scott. I'm never <laughs> 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 okay, about 30 seconds left. It's like most people are texting. Yes, Mike. Text, tweet, telephone. These used to be called telephones. <laughs> or tell. 10 seconds. Well, I'm very, very grateful that you're in my life. Goodbye. And so, so, okay, stop. So, so John just ha just did, gave me the perfect segue. Most people, these, I'm starting to use telephones a lot more back to the telephone because I don't have to bounce. What time? The 14th, 7 o'clock, Kirkland. You know, you, go, you can just call, hey, Jason, it's Dave, and so forth. It's really handy. But most people use them for texting. But when John said that, it cracked me up because I did a big teacher's conference a few weeks ago, and I hear this guy in the front row, I'm very grateful for you. Yes, I am. I know. I don't know. Some speaker just told me to call you and tell you. <laughs> I just went, no. It's supposed to be your idea. <laughs> So last thing I want to talk about is just this concept of sharing. Don't let him know it's me. Tell him it was you. <laughs> I was never a guy that did drugs and all that crazy crap. And as I said, it killed so many people. I have a very adamant attitude towards dope and coke and all that nonsense, pills, prescription medication. But I was always a, a kind of an adrenaline junkie. So I was skydiving and I had seven friends. We all signed up. And it was a long time ago, so it was out at Issaquah when they used to have skydiving. So I know this by, on Monday, it's for the following Saturday. So there was Monday, then there were six of us, and then on Tuesday it was five. And then Wednesday, I think two guys dropped off, it was three. And then on Friday, 
I got a couple guys call. Uh, hey, Dave. <coughs> I got a sore throat. I'm not sure if I can make it tomorrow. So I walk up to Issaquah Skydiving to the counter. Can I help you? And I go, yes. David Brooke, party of eight. <laughs> he goes, where's your friends? I go, I don't have any. <laughs> it's just me. And I went skydiving by myself. There's nobody to share it with. So whether you're texting, tweeting, telling, or telephoning somebody, make sure that you let them know how grateful you are to have them in your life. And the thing that I would say with a gratitude journal, as I said, I sell my own. I don't care if you get a spiral notebook. I urge people to try it. It's the healthiest coping mechanism. It can change your life. It can transform your life. And in my case, I truly, truly, truly feel it saved my life. And it can save you guys as too. Thanks a lot. Questions? Question all. John, you, do you put down gratitude journal? Uh, no, I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, real quick, you do work for the Pacific Institute as well, yes, correct? Yes. And can you just share with what that is? Uh, how many people know about Lou Tice and the Pacific Institute? Yeah. So, oh wow, fair amount. How's Lou doing? Uh, Lou passed away a couple years ago. Yeah, and I was telling Jason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You guys, you got the, what, the, what's your name? What's your name? What? IVN. IVN? What a cool name. I speak to a lot of groups that are around IVN's age in schools, as I mentioned. And no offense to your generation, they don't have half the sense of humor this group does. I'm telling you, it's just, I say also, I think some stuff's really funny, and they go, it's not funny. It was this guy. <laughs> like, whatever. So, um, no, but the Pacific Institute, Lou did pass away. And um, I mentioned again, I think it was to Jason, that, uh, or maybe Scott, that when the iconic figures like the Steve Jobs pass away, it's tough. But his whole thing was transformational leadership and what goes on between your ears. And this whole idea of reticular activating system and scotomas and how we have blind spots and how we think. And who was it? It was Eric. And, I make, and I'll tell you the reason I, I make such a big deal about the names. Is Bob? Is it Bob? Uh, good, yeah. Tax, tax, tax season. <laughs> I wanted him to get a pace going there. Didn't you? Bob's good. He's okay. well, I got the tax season though. He must be a CPA. But the reason, and, and I heard Angela, and I heard Eric, and uh, I didn't hear your name, and I know Joanne and John, and so Ivy. Anyway, the did you say your name? Where? It was on the key she dropped right in There's a lot of, I was talking to Eric earlier with a C. Well, Thank you guys for such support. And about this idea that when people say, I don't have a very good memory or I don't have time to write in a gratitude journal, you keep saying that, that'll be the case. And so to me, one of the reasons why I pay a lot of attention to names is because it's not that difficult to just pay attention and just focus for that minute. And if it's that, and if it's five minutes for a gratitude journal to change your life, uh, it's, I, I look at it just like brushing your teeth and all the other things that we do, but it can make such a big difference. So what is your name, by the way? I'm Shelly. Shelly. Nice to meet you, Shelly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm debating when John said, do you want to see it? No, I know what John was filming, so it's okay. <laughs> no, I just am debating with this crowd. I have a friend who's a stand-up comedian, and I'm just thinking, is this too risque? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. I know. Now. Okay, no, I'll pass. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you so much.